Let me take you back to your first lecture in statistics. Remember that one where you're dealing with means, modes, and medians, and standard deviations? Now everything's going along real smoothly until this equation goes up on the board. And it's about this time that someone sitting in the front row usually will ask the question, like, uh, what's the deal with that n minus one situation? Now at this point, the lecturer has exactly two options. One, they could kind of hand wave it away and say, look, it's to do with this thing called degrees of freedom. Don't worry about it too much now, hey. Or two, they could suck it up and actually explain the thing. Now, I don't blame lecturers for going with option one more often than not. It's a sticky topic, but more's the pity because hiding behind degrees of freedom is actually the foundations of statistics itself. To understand this topic is really to understand statistics. So, with that in mind, we're going to get deep into the weeds. My name's Justin Zeltzer from zstatistics.com. Let's do this. Okay, so here we are with my presentation on degrees of freedom. As you can see before us, we have four little sections we're going to get through. We're going to start with the intuition behind degrees of freedom. That'll give us a sort of foundation from which we can look at the practical applications of degrees of freedom. And we'll find out at this point that it's all to do with this concept of estimation. We then break it down and have a look at three common scenarios where degrees of freedom are used. The first one is in descriptive statistics. So looking at things like standard deviations and even skewness and kurtosis and the like. After that, we'll have a look at degrees of freedom in regression. It often pops up when we're looking at regression. And I think I've got a really good visualization for you so you can see how degrees of freedom works there. And finally, we'll have a look at degrees of freedom as they apply in chi-squared tests. The two tests that uh, I'm going to be looking at are the chi-squared goodness of fit test and also the chi-squared test for independence. Now, of course, it's the same concept of degrees of freedom all the way along. But showing you how it applies in these three different scenarios will hopefully give you a full picture of what degrees of freedom and thus statistics is really about. Now, you might be wondering what this strange item is here on the right-hand side of this presentation. It is indeed a sea urchin which is going to form the subject matter for all the examples I'm going to be using in this presentation. And specifically, we're going to try to figure out how many spikes do sea urchins have. Now, true story about sea urchins. Uh, my brother actually stepped on one when he was about eight years old. And, and a full 11 years later, they pulled out one of the spikes from his foot. So it had just been lodged in there for his entire adolescence. Anyway, that's by the by. Okay, so let's move into the intuition. So here I've said, consider counting the spikes on a sample of five sea urchins. And here is our sample outcome here. We've got five individual measurements, each pertaining to the number of spikes on five separate sea urchins. Now, as I said in the intro, you've probably met a few of these sample statistics before, the mean, the median, and the standard deviation. Perhaps you haven't quite touched on skewness and kurtosis. We don't really need to worry about what they are at the moment, but uh, I'll throw them in just for good measure. Now, you can get an output like this even from Excel, from Microsoft Excel. You just put in these five values into the descriptive statistics dialog, and you press the button, and all of a sudden you'll get these outputs here. Now, the first thing that'll happen when you get this output is that your lecturer might ask you, what's your estimate of the mean? using these sample statistics. Now, if you think for a moment, you might be a bit perplexed as to why she's used the term estimate. And indeed, our little student here asks, wait, who's estimating? And it's a pretty interesting question. Think about it. We've got five observations and we find the mean of those five observations. That's just the average or the mean of those five observations, right? Why is that an estimate? What possibly could we be estimating? Surely we just 
have the mean, don't we? Similarly with the median, surely that's just the median. It's not an estimate of the median. Same with standard deviation and skewness. But that's where this topic really comes into contact with the general concepts of statistics. Because indeed, these sample statistics are just estimates of theorized population values. And what that means is, as statisticians, we don't actually care about these five sea urchins. We're going to use these five sea urchins to try to get some information about what we think the mean is for the population, the whole population of sea urchins. So it's a subtle point, but these sample statistics are actually our estimates for the whole population of infinite numbers of sea urchins. And that's a crucial point to kind of get your head around, which I think never really gets discussed in those first early statistics lectures. So degrees of freedom, which I've shortened to DF here, are just the number of pieces of information we have to estimate the population values. And this definition is actually going to stick with us throughout this entire tutorial. So I'll repeat it. It's the number of pieces of information we have. Sometimes people will say independent pieces of information we have to estimate the population values. So looking at the sample statistics here, let's just pick off the mean and the standard deviation. The sample values are given as X bar, X with a bar on top, and S. But in essence, what they are, are estimates of the population mean mu and the population standard deviation sigma. And as we're going to find out in the next section, despite the fact we have five observations here, it's not so obvious how many degrees of freedom we have in estimating each of our parameters here. It'll turn out we actually only have four degrees of freedom with which to estimate sigma. And for skewness and kurtosis, we'd actually only have three and two degrees of freedom, respectively. But for now, I just wanted to get that point across that in statistics, we're always taking a sample of something and we're using that sample to estimate a population value. And so the number of pieces of information we have to estimate that population value is the degrees of freedom. Okay, so with that intuition now under our belts, let's take a look at how degrees of freedom operates in descriptive statistics more generally. Now, to get our heads around it, I've constructed here the simplest sample I can think of, and that's one where the sample size is exactly one. So this is 213, the first of our sea urchins, the number of spikes on that sea urchin was 213. So imagine we just had a sample that included that sea urchin. Now, our lecturer might ask here, what is your estimate for the mean mu? Now, our student here might think for a bit, but it's uh, pretty trivial. It's just 213, right? Even though we've got the smallest, crappiest sample possible, your best estimate for where the true population mean is, is at 213. So, in other words, there's one piece of information that we have available, one degree of freedom that we have with which to estimate the population mean. What's your estimate for the standard deviation sigma? Now, even if you haven't dealt too widely with standard deviation, appreciate that it's just a measure of the spread of the particular variable. So looking at our sample here, is it possible to get an estimate of the spread? Our student seems to have a little problem with this, and indeed he should, because we can't generate an estimate for the dispersion here, right? You might think that, okay, we've got a sample of size 1, so it, it doesn't vary, it doesn't have any kind of variance around it, so the standard deviation should be 0, right? But that's not actually the case. It's not 0, it's actually undefined. And again, that boils down to the idea that we're trying to estimate this population spread. And looking at the sample, we actually have no idea whether it came from a population with a large spread or a very narrow spread. This doesn't give us any information at all. So in fact, we have zero degrees of freedom and thus cannot estimate it. And even if you had a look at the formula for the standard deviation, even if you don't quite understand it yet, have a look at the denominator. It says n minus one. So clearly, if we subbed in all the values here and we put in n being one, we're gonna be dividing by zero, which as you know, mathematically speaking, is an explosion. <laughs> 
Okay, so that, that clears us for the trivial case of having one observation. But let's extend that a little bit further to see what happens when we have a sample of size 2. So here are our first two sea urchins, 213 and 180 spikes on each of those respectively. Now let's see what we can do to describe this data set. Here we have it on a number line, there's 180 and there's 213. Now the mean is somewhat trivial, you, you could sum those two together and divide by 2 and you'd find the mean, which we're giving as x bar here, at uh, 196.5. Now how would you go about developing an estimate for the spread? Well, we can think about really obvious measures of spread, which include the range, which is just the maximum minus the minimum. But that's pretty basic and ultimately is really affected by outliers. But a more statistically robust measure of the spread might be to say, well, let's try to find the average distance to the mean or the average deviation to the mean. But of course, you're going to have a problem there because given that this is the mean, all the positive deviations will exactly equal out with all the negative deviations. So finding the average deviation from the mean is just going to give us a value of zero. So we can't really use that. Using absolute values is also quite clunky statistically. So another option at our disposal might be to find the average squared deviation from the mean. Because we know that when we square those deviations, the negative ones are going to become positive again, right? So if we find the average squared deviation from the mean, we're finding some measure of the spread, a very statistically robust measure of the spread of this distribution. And indeed, that's what variance is. The statistical measure of variance is the average squared deviation from the mean mu. Now, we'll get to degrees of freedom in a second, but you can see how this will congeal all of our knowledge of other aspects of statistics to get there, right? Let's keep going. So let's have a look at the formula for variance. It's the sum of x minus mu all squared on n. That's the sum of those squared deviations from the mean divided by the number of observations, therefore giving us the average squared deviation from the mean. But you'll notice it actually has the population mean here, as it should, because that's the true mean. But on this number line, where is that population mean? Appreciate that it could be all the way down here, and maybe our sample just happened to be two fairly large sea urchins. Or alternatively, the population mean might be all the way up here. But wherever that particular population mean is, theoretically we could find an average squared deviation from that population mean. And we'd have this statistically robust calculation for the spread of the data, right? Cool, well that's all well and good, but guess what? We don't have the population mean. We only have a sample of size 2. We have no idea what the population mean is. The best we can do is use the sample mean as an estimate for the population mean, right? So our formula is going to change a little bit. Instead of using this sum of the squared distances from the population mean, we're going to do the sum of the squared distances from the sample mean x bar. And instead of calling it sigma squared, we're now going to call it s squared, which is the sample variance. But there's a problem with this formula. We know that originally we wanted the average squared deviation from the population mean. But of all the places that that population mean could be, our calculation is minimized if we put it bang on that sample mean. Which is exactly what we're doing. If the population mean was anywhere else, this calculation would be larger. So to account for the fact that x bar is effectively a best case scenario, for mu, we need to inflate our estimate for the population variance somewhat. And that's why the denominator is no longer n, but is n minus 1, artificially increasing that calculation. Now, of course, this is the variance, and to get to the standard deviation, you're going to be taking the square root of all that. But the same principle applies. The degrees of freedom here is still n minus 1. It's only with that second observation that we were, that we were allowed to get a calculation for the variance and thus the standard deviation. Now I go into the variance and standard deviation in a little bit more depth 
in a video that I'll put the link up for here. But let's carry on to see how degrees of freedom applies to regression. Now, if you've not dealt with regression before, just appreciate that it's a way of assessing the relationship between two variables. And here the question might be, how does water temperature affect the number of spikes found on sea urchins? And indeed, we have our two variables here. The temperature is on our x-axis and the number of spikes on our sea urchins is on the y-axis. So with whatever sample we get, a regression just tries to put a line of best fit through that sample. But again, there's a certain number of degrees of freedom that we have here as well. And to understand it, let's sort of pair it back to the minimum possible number of observations that we could think of in this scenario. So here's the question. Our lecturer asks, what's the minimum number of observations you require to run this regression? Where we've got spikes as a function of the temperature. Now, our student here might say, well, look, I think you only need two observations because with two observations, you can draw a line of best fit and therefore you can get an assessment of the gradient between these two variables. And you can also get an assessment of the y-intercept. And to some degrees, that's correct. But in fact, this is where we have to ask ourselves that same question. What are we estimating here? Well, a regression not only estimates these betas, which is the gradient and the y-intercept respectively, but it also estimates the uncertainty we have with those values. Now, remember your regression output? That first column in your regression output deals with the coefficients. And then everything else will assess the standard errors, the t-stats, the p-values. That's all to do with the uncertainty around those coefficients. So realistically, with just two observations, we cannot estimate that uncertainty, right? That line of best fit is going to go straight through those two observations, no matter where they are. And it's only with that third observation that we indeed have what we call a degree of freedom, such that the regression line can cut through those points and we can finally get a little bit of error in there that we can use to estimate that uncertainty. So again, this boils down to the idea that we only have here a small sample and we're using it to estimate parameters from the population level. And that's why you might see the degrees of freedom being written as n minus k minus 1, where k is the number of x variables. So in this case, because we have one x variable, the degrees of freedom is n minus 2. So if we had 10 observations... 10 dots here on our graph, we would have 8 degrees of freedom with which we'd be estimating our coefficients and standard errors of those coefficients. Now get this, this is my favourite bit. Let's now change the regression somewhat and add another x variable which we're going to say is the salinity or the salt, the saltiness of the water. So that might affect the number of spikes on sea urchins as well. The more salty the water is, maybe the less spikes I don't know, I'm doing this completely theoretically, knowing exactly zero about sea urchins. But we're in it for the stats, right? So again, I might ask you, what's the minimum number of observations required to run a regression? And you might think, all right, three. Remember from last time we said three? But in this case, we're no longer drawing a line of best fit. The graphical analogy here is to say we're sort of drawing a plane of best fit. There's This is solidity is kind of coming out of the page here. Imagine it's sort of three-dimensional. So this regression equation insinuates that there's a constant gradient with respect to temperature and a constant gradient with respect to salinity. So we're effectively mapping out a plane in three-dimensional space. But the same problem here applies. If we have three, if we have three observations in this three-dimensional space, you can put a plane through all those three points irrespective of where they are. I mean, just look at the room around you. If you had three sort of hovering points in the room around you, you could put a, a big piece of cardboard through all those points irrespective of where those three observations are. So there's my big piece of cardboard, right? <laughs> and it's only with that fourth observation that our, that our plane of best fit actually can get some kind of error terms associated with it. 
And that's how this degrees of freedom works. In this case, k is two because we have two x variables. So if we have four observations, we now only have one degree of freedom. So you'll often hear lecturers say that additional variables, additional x variables, eats up a degree of freedom. And again, I deal with this a little bit more in depth in a video I've done on regression specifically. So I'll put that link up here. But hopefully that's given you a sort of an image of how degrees of freedom works from the uh, point of view of regression. Okay, time for the final section, which is about chi-squared tests. And again, I've given you this question here. Are the three sea urchin subtypes equally prevalent? Now, this is to do with the chi-squared goodness of fit test. And here I've said a sample of 60 sea urchins is taken. So there's 60. We've got 25 of those sea urchins were the parasentrotus subtype. 22 were echinoida and 13 were spatangoida. And the little O here represents the fact that this is our observed distribution. Now, if you've not done chi-squared tests before, just try to soak it all up. But if you have, you'll tell me that not only do we need an observed frequency distribution, but we need some kind of expected frequency distribution to compare it to. And if I'm asking you if the three sea urchin subtypes are equally prevalent, you'd tell me that out of the 60 total, it needs to be 20, 20, and 20 expected in each of these categories, right? That would be the case if they were equally prevalent, these three subtypes. Now, we're going to try to figure out how many degrees of freedom this test will have, but this is going to be slightly different. In the previous two instances, we've been critically concerned with the number of observations that we have, and in this case, we have 60 observations. In both the previous examples, we had n minus something, right? So it started with the number of observations. But that's not the case in a chi-squared test. Because what we're doing in this case is we're actually enumerating the distances of the observed minus, minus the expected in each of these three categories. So if our lecturer was to ask, what are we estimating here? The correct response from our student would be, well, deviations from the expected frequencies. So Parasentrotus has five more observations than we expected. Echinoida has two more observations than we expected under, the, under our initial hypothesis. And Spatangoida is a little bit less than what we would expect if they were all equally prevalent. And here's our chi-squared statistic. And this is true of all chi-squared tests. It's always the observed frequency minus the expected frequency squared divided by the expected frequency, and we sum them all up. These little subscript i's in the formula actually represent the categories. So we're summing across categories, not across individual observations. And in total, we have three categories. So if the question is how many independent pieces of information do we have, we're really asking that in the context of creating this chi-squared statistic. So check this out. If we know we have 60 observations, sure, we first needed to know that we had 25 Parasentrotus sea urchins. So that's one piece of information that was independently required. We then needed to know how many Echinoida sea urchins there were, and there was 22. Now here's the rub. After we have those two observations, we don't need to know how many Spatangoida we have, right? We can actually figure it out. This is not an independent piece of information, this 13 here. We could actually subtract this from 60 and get that result. It's like if I told you that my statistics class was 43% men. Do I really need to tell you that it's also 57% women? I don't, do I? And that's the same thing here. We only have two degrees of freedom. And that's why we have this uh, calculation here, df equals k minus 1. So let's now quickly have a look at a chi-squared test for independence. The question here is asked, were the three CH and subtypes equally affected by coral bleaching? So I've got a new sample here. It's a sample of 60 sea urchins taken from waters near unbleached coral and a further 60 from near bleached coral. So here's that distribution. So the first thing we're going to need to do is get the expected frequencies for each of the six cells here in this joint distribution. 
Now, when I say expected, I mean expected assuming the subtype distribution is independent of the state of the coral that surrounds it. So under principles of independence, we know we're just going to take the marginal value. So if we're going to try to find the expected frequency in this first cell here, we take the two marginal values, the 60 times the 50, and you divide by the grand total 120, and you'll get 25 in that case. Same goes for the second cell over here. Again, it's going to be 60 times 50 divided by 120. And you can do that for all of the six cells that we have. Now, the question might be, how many degrees of freedom do we have in this table? Well, again, let's think about the number of independent pieces of information we have. 31, that's an independent piece, that's an independent piece of information. So there's at least one. But as soon as we know that that's 31, we can figure out that this has to be 19, right? Because it's got to sum to 50. So that 19 is no longer an independent piece of information. That still leaves us with four unknowns after we have that first 31 given to us. And it's only that second piece of information, say we get this 18 given to us, that the rest of this joint distribution actually drops out. So you can see that if we know 18, we'll be able to figure out that this is 32 for the same reason. And similarly, we'll be able to find that this is 11 because it needs to sum to 60. And this will be 9 because it also needs to sum to 60, this column. So even though we have six, it seems like we have six cells here, we only have two degrees of freedom. And that's why you get this degrees of freedom calculation being R minus 1 times C minus 1. Number of rows minus 1 times the number of columns minus 1. So because we have three rows and two columns, we have 2 times 1, which equals 2 degrees of freedom. So that's it, my friends. That is degrees of freedom in the three main contexts that you'll find it. My name's Justin Zeltzer. If you like this video, please subscribe to the channel and do all that kind of stuff. I'm zstatistics.com if you want to have a look at all the other videos and other stuff that I do. But I hope you've enjoyed it and feel free to get in touch. Catch you around.